on to another panel, and this time it will be led by a presentation first, and then we'll follow up with a panel discussion, really taking a look at the dynamics regarding the investment potential in the hotel sector across the continent. Now, this one certainly comes at a critical time where we've seen players like the, the Marriott Group really see lead the charge in a lot of developments in this particular space, and we will be following up as to what some of the winners have been doing correctly, and even those who might have positioned themselves in weaker performing markets where the challenges are and how they're trying to rectify those particular dynamics. So our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, will start off with a presentation by Wayne Troughton. He's the CEO of HTI Consulting. Following that presentation, Wayne will also then moderate this particular panel discussion and his panelists who will be joining him, he will reintroduce them up on stage just to make sure that following the presentation, or Wayne, do you prefer that you do the presentation and your panelists are on stage? What are you more comfortable with? Fantastic, perfect. We'll start with the presentation, follow up with a few questions if there might be any, and the panelists will then make their way on stage. Those panelists consist of the head of corporate advisory for GRIT, Bevan Smith, Ilaria Benucci, who is the head of construction and real estate at CDC Group, Ken Osei, who's the principal investment officer at the IFC, and David Damiba, managing partner and chief investment officer of Casada Capital Management. Firstly, for those of you who are making your way to the IFC Edge conference, please do feel free to make your way out to the exhibition center. But for now, let's warmly welcome to the front of the stage, Wayne Troughton, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much. Um, just to note that we, we have produced a report, um, which I think we did a, a drop on the seats yesterday, and that's really just a um, overview of the performance of the hospitality markets in Africa, looking at East, Southern, and Western Africa, and looking at sort of key performance and new supply and sort of an outlook going forward. So part of my presentation is going to be looking at that as a sort of a backdrop, and then we're going to d delve into different sort of strategies that investors will be adopting in some of these markets, and the different views in terms of what their take is on the markets, basically looking at different sort of market dynamics. So um, I think it's, it's important to note, I mean, it's good to see the panelists that we have, because the market has changed over the years in terms of from a hospitality perspective from individual asset owners, often first-time investors, moving towards uh, more structured type investors where we're looking at um, f structured funds that are looking at hotel investments, cross-border transactions, focused on a regional basis. We're looking at some of the groups that have, uh, are expanding and owner-operator groups. So it's, it's interesting to look at their strategies which, which might be different to individual owners in each market and to look at how, they, how they're expanding and, and adapting that. So moving on to presentation, um, I'm going to start looking at, at each market. Well, just going to touch a bit on it. I'm not going to go in, in detail. Also, if you, if you didn't manage to get the, the, the printed copy, we, we'd be more than happy, and API can distribute to you the electronic copy of our report. So look, we'll look at Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, and Western Africa briefly, looking at key um, economic and, and market performance data, and then looking at what, this, what these, how we try and categorize these into different strategies and markets that we see that uh, investors and, and owners might be adopting in each market. So if we look um, initially at, at Southern Africa, if we look from a growth perspective, Namibia and South Africa, I think we all know, um, Namibia is quite linked to South Africa, so the economic growth patterns are quite, uh, follow a similar trend. South Africa's growth has been very slow and is expected to remain sort of in the low 1 to 2% over the, over the short to medium term. Um, Zambian growth often quite linked to, to the copper, uh, copper prices and is, is also, the growth is not that significant. Zimbabwe, I think we all know um, the situation in Zimbabwe over the years, and also currently with the more of a monetary crisis, the growth is not expected, uh, there's not significant growth expected, the declining growth is, is continually expected relating to the currency pressure. 
And Botswana is a steady performer, um, not expected to, to grow massively, but as a strong base, um, sort of a medium income country. If we have a look at just some of the, some of the hotel performance data, this is based on STR data for the key markets in, in Africa. And looking at Southern Africa, if we, th this is based on USD terms from an, from an ADR perspective, average, average daily rate, and then an occupancy perspective. ADR in the Southern African markets, none of the markets have actually increased in terms of ADR in dollar terms. A lot have increased in terms of local currency terms, but so this is really mostly due to a, a currency fluctuation which is impacting these markets. From an oc occupancy perspective, the key markets that have increased occupancy are Victoria Falls, Gaborone, and, and Cape Town, and Umschlange. Um, from an Umschlange perspective, I think it's it increased significantly over the last um, few years, and also there's been a lot of additional supply as more and more corporates are moving out to that area. It's a market that has performed really well and is expected to continue to perform well. Cape Town had a bit of a, a blimp last year due to the um, political situation as well as, as, as well as due to, or mainly due to the water crisis. Um, and that has seen a, a positive growth in the market considering that there's been a lot of additional supply that's come into the market in Cape Town. That's been extremely positive. About 1,300 rooms have entered the market since 2017. Um, Vic Falls has increased. Uh, Vic Falls is often considered kind of separate and linked more to leisure tourism markets that add-ons to Cape Town and other markets, and has, has seen a bit of a revival, especially in the in the upper scale and upper upscale markets. Gaborone has has increased despite the, despite the new supply entering the market of the Hilton Garden Inn, and it continues to continues to grow. From a decline perspective, uh, obviously Bulawayo and Harare and Zimbabwe. Um, due to the political situation and economic situation there, it uh, has declined significantly. And if we look at new supply, um, there's, there's a lot of different ways to look at new supply. We prefer to look at what's physically under construction. There's a lot of other, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of other projects that might be what they call in the pipeline signed by operators, but these are often in the early stages of development. So we try and focus more on what's in the construction. Cape Town will come under more pressure in the, in the short term. There's 735 rooms currently under construction, mostly in the sort of mid-scale and, and low-scale uh, markets. Um, Schlange has uh, limited, or around about 400 rooms entering the market. Lusaka continue to have rooms despite the significant new supply that's happened over the last few years. And Santon, including Rosebank, is around about 600 rooms, and Vintuk limited supply of around about 150. So what does this kind of mean? So what we've tried to do is we've tried to look at different criteria that investors might be looking at and also impacting owners' decisions who might already be in that market. And we're looking at a sort of a market temperature at the end, which we've kind of created to try and classify these markets that might might be able to group them from an investment strategy perspective, which obviously sim sizzling markets being the hottest market and then the frozen or cooling markets being the least uh, attractive on a short-term basis at this point in time. And we've looked at different criteria, obviously the existing occupancy, then looking at the growth potential of, from an economy perspective as well as the economic and polit political risk. So these two criteria are probably are more... Um, longer term criteria, whereas in the short term, we have things like future supply, occupancy and ADR, and the current performance of the market. So we're going to unpack this with the investors a little bit later to understand you know, how important each of these criteria are, is and how does it affect their investment decision. Um, because if you look at some markets, uh, like Cape Town, for example, there is new, quite a lot of new, new future supply coming in, but it does have high future growth potential. So we're expecting some of these simmering markets are the markets where often we feel that you need to be, but it might, on a short-term basis, might not be um, that desirable, but some of these markets might take a longer-term longer -term view. Looking at market like Lusaka, Lusaka has come under increased pressure. There's a lot of new supply into the market. The occupancies are low, around about 43%, and we're expecting, in the short term, the occupancies in ADRs to decline. So we're seeing that market to be more of a, a cooling market and reducing uh, 
um, attractiveness in the short term. Other markets like Gaborone, we're seeing the sort of lukewarm, toasty kind of markets where there's not a lot of um, growth potential, uh, but very steady, uh, steady markets that are expected, not also not expected to have a lot of new supply entering those markets. So, Okay. If we look at moving on to East Africa from an economic perspective, um, Ethiopia and, and Kenya are some of the top performers there with a strong base, strong economic base, strong economies and, and expected growth, especially Ethiopia with growth expected a high 7% into the mid 8% to 8 and in Kenya also expecting to increase or have a significant growth potential in the short, short term. Uh, Tanzania, the growth has, has dropped. Um, it does have future potential with the oil and, and gas in the country. However, the, the short-term political environment hasn't been that positive, as which has seen investor sentiment uh, reduce. And so the growth is not as, as high as what one would expect. Uganda is expected to grow more significantly with uh, activity happening around the, the oil discovery. We're expecting that to come into the economic figures over the next few years. Rwanda has, has continued good growth, although what you need to remember with Rwanda is off of extremely low base um, as they diversify from a purely agricultural economy and have managed to diversify. They've still off of extremely low base. So looking at the performance in these markets, if we look at occupancy again, um, Kigali has seen an increase in, in occupancy performance. Uh, as, the, as the market diversifies and has managed to absorb some of the supply. But what's to remember here is it's off a very low base. Occupancy is still in the, uh, you know, below 50%. So these are not, um, you know, although there has been a, a positive growth, there's still a long way for that market to absorb all those rooms. From Addis Ababa perspective, the, um, there's been limited new, or well, there, has, there has been quite a bit of new supply in the market, but the market has continued to outperform that new supply. There is a lot of expected supply entering the market, which we'll look at in the next slide, and that's going to put a, quite a lot of pressure on that market. Um, Dar es Salaam has, has declined slightly. It hasn't had any new supply into the market, but there is new supply coming. And that's mainly due to the political sentiment in, in the country and the government clamping down on, on government spending, which has also impacted on, on reducing conference growth. Nairobi has remained relatively flat um, due to some of the security uh, concerns in the, earlier in the year, as well as um, the new supply that has entered that market. That market remains under, uh, under a strain at this point in time. Kampala has, um, is expected, has declined slightly, but is expected to bounce back with not much new supply expected in the pipeline. Looking at new supply, um, Addis is, has the market which has the most new supply under construction. Some of this has been in construction for a while, so we're not expecting all of this. So there are a lot of projects that have started um, and haven't, haven't completed. And due to often in, in Addis, the, the type of investment structuring, the lack of um, liquidity and access to capital, it, it, often buildings start without being fully structured from a finance perspective. Dar es Salaam, there's, uh, the Ratana Hotel is under construction as well as the um, City Lodge, which are expected to open next year. In Nairobi, there's around 1,295 rooms under construction of which there are 641 rooms which are expected to open um, by the end of this year. So a lot of new supply. I think from a supply perspective, we're expecting a lot in, in East Africa. And this is expected, obviously, to put quite a lot of pressure on these markets. Um, but if we look at the markets, the, the simmering markets of Addis, um, Nairobi, and Kampala, uh, for different reasons. I think Addis and Nairobi, the reason we've classified them is uh, the occupancies are low at the moment, or relatively low. They both have very high growth potential, and these are kind of markets that uh, strong infrastructure, 
good air access, that there are markets that often investors feel they need to be in, but in, in the short term, these markets are both going to come under pressure, expecting occupancies and average daily rates to, to, to probably decline, especially in, in Addis Ababa and also possibly in Nairobi. From a Kigali perspective, this is, we see this in, in Dar es Salaam potentially as cooling markets for different reasons. Kigali more because there's been a lot of new supply into the market and the, the inability for the market to actually absorb the demand to keep up with that, that oversupply. Kigali, from a diversification um, perspective, it has adopted a strategy more of um, kind of build it and, and they will come. So in terms of it's been more supply-driven growth and then with the trying to get the demand to, to catch up to, to supply. Kampala, there's been limited new, new supply. We're expecting this market to, to increase. Um, it's not, the growth potential is high because of the advent of, of oil and, um, and gas, and, but the political risk we see is low to medium. So moving on to West Africa, if we look at um, Ivory Coast and Senegal and these two markets and Ghana being the highest growth potential and, and expected growth uh, with Ivory Coast growth expected in, in the, in the mid-7%, Senegal in the, in the sixes, and Ghana uh, between sort of low 7%. All these markets um, are expected, growth is expected to quite, quite stabilize markets and expected to grow quite significantly of, of quite a large base. Um, Benin of a much smaller base is expected similar kind of growth, um, growth uh, factors. But, however, as mentioned, it's off a, it's off a very low base, so in terms of its ability to absorb new supply will be far more limited than the other larger markets. Nigeria is seeing a, a sort of a, a recovery at this point in time, a slight recovery with the oil prices increasing um, and the economic situation improving. Um, w growth here is still expected to be relatively slow but it's a market where there's been hardly any new supply in the market, and it's a market that, again, that, that um, investors have, have always looked at as, as a longer-term market. So looking at, uh, at performance, I think the Lagos has seen a slight Im improvement to July 2019 in terms of occupancies, we're expecting this to continue. Some hotels have actually increased a lot more significantly, ones that are well located in, in strategic locations and good quality products, because due to the lack of new supply over the years, I think the, here, the well, good performers can perform well above the market. Um, in Cotonou, we've seen an increase in, in occupancy, but this is, this is largely due to um, the Novotel closing um, and also the Benin Marina closing from, from a renovation perspective, which has meant that the, the hotel market are able to increase occupancies on the remaining hotels and also managed to push rates because of demand outstripping supply. And Abidjan occupancies have, have declined slightly due to new supply entering that market and Dakar also, but Dakar's off a very high base. Occupancies are are very high and it's a good perform both of these markets have performed well and expected to um, attract new investment into them. If we look at uh, new supply, um, Lagos, is a, there's a lot of supply that's actually been under construction for a while that actually stopped with the economic situation and this is expected to increase um, and, and to, to gain momentum. These projects are seem to be back on, on, on track. Um, Accra, there's quite a lot of new supply planned as well as Dakar and, and Abidjan. And Cotonou also supply, which will put quite a lot of strain on that market, being a small, small market. So just looking at classifications, um, Abidjan and Dakar we're seeing as, as we've classified them as sizzling, sizzling markets, um, simmering to sizzling. If you look at uh, the growth potential, continued high growth potential, Dakar especially has had very high occupancies. The average in the market there is 76%. So we're expecting a lot of new supply to enter into to that market, as well as um, occupancies. 
will we'll absorb that supply and we, we're not expecting them to increase because 76% is pretty high, but we're expecting them to, to level off. Abidjan, we're expecting a, a slight decline in occupancies as new hotels enter the market, but it has good long-term growth potential with medium political risk. So those two markets are, are the markets that we see as the most opportunities in a short and a long term. From an Accra perspective, um, has declined slightly in the, in the short term and occupancies are, are still performing well and there's strong future growth potential expected. And Lagos, we're expecting is more of a longer term view with occupancies in the 50s and um, a lot of new supply entering the market with high growth potential. So just to touch a little bit on, on strategies, so we've classified these into just focusing on, where's the thing? on looking at cooling markets. I won't go into too much depth, but we're trying to understand what, what these options open to investors as well as in, uh, to, to owners. From an investor perspective, we're looking at these markets, Kigali, Dar es Salaam, Lesaka, and Cotonou. The strategies will be a bit different. Um, Kigali is, the strategy is, because there's been a lot of new supply in the market, I think the strategy is not necessarily to add in new supply, but could be looking at existing projects or acquisitions or invest in existing developments. Whereas a market like Dar es Salaam, which the cooling might be more due to political reasons, you can take a longer term view on that market. And because there, there's not a lot of stock in that market, you might not be able to find existing assets to acquire and you could take a longer term view and look at a greenfield type development. Um, markets like Lusaka are gonna come under sort of increased pressure from an owner's perspective and they might have to look at things like these might enter um, a lot of strain in terms of potential distressed asset situations as occupancies drop and more new supply enters the market and growth doesn't keep up with supply. So looking at the simmering markets, um, simmering markets we're looking at some of these are strategies adopted for different reasons. So if there's a lot of new supply in the short term entering these markets, but they have a, long, a lot of long term growth potential, and some of these markets like in Addis, the strategy will be probably more likely to take existing hotels that are under construction that haven't been completed for some time, and also in, in Lagos, rather than build something new and put some fresh uh, um, injection into those. Um, there's other markets, there might be different strategies in terms of conversions of existing greenfield, especially in these markets where supply is, uh, significant supply is expected to put a strain on the market, we wouldn't expect too much greenfield development. And from an owner perspective, these markets um, could be longer term views, could be opportunities for for uh, hoteliers to sell their existing assets in these, in these markets as they have a longer term growth potential. Um, but in th these markets will be very important to, to get a, a, good, a good price on your asset. Um, or you could hold these to, to justify the, um, in the long term. And then just look at the last one and then we can move on to discussions is looking at the sizzling markets. These markets, um, you would look at obviously acquiring or greenfield developments. Um, it will depend on that particular market though. Um, in, in a market where there's an upswing, you might be looking at differently building greenfield developments or, or acquisition, but depending if you can acquire at the right price. The same strategy from a owner strategy perspective would be more of a buyer's market. So, it would be up to the, um, the seller to, 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 to get, a, uh, a, a, get a good price, but not to be, not a, to be too high a price, otherwise uh, other parties, the investors would probably rather invest in that market or, or do a greenfield development. So I, I think you know, it'd be good to just unpack these with my panel and um, without any further ado, unless there's any questions uh, from the audience before we bring up the, the panelists. Okay, well, we can hold questions until afterwards. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to bring up my, if my panel could come up, Ilaria Benucci from CDC, Ken Ose from IFC, David Demiba from Casada, and um, 
Oh, in Devon. <laughs> yeah, he forgot you there, Bev. Yeah, great. I think um, if we could start by, I think it's important for the audience to understand the context of your, uh, your inputs. So if you could just give a little background on yourselves as well as your companies and what your, your strategies are and what your interest is in the hospitality sector in Africa. So if we could start with you, Laria, that would be great. Um, I, uh, I assume by now that the audience is familiar with CDC Group. Uh, fully owned by the British government, um, investing long term in sub-Saharan Africa, dual mandate of commercial returns and impact. Uh, I lead the real estate team and efforts, and in uh, specific in the space of hotels, uh, we are uh, an investor in uh, Onomo. Onomo is a pan-African um, economy business hotel uh, chain. We are now present, we have about um, 3,000 rooms. We, are in, uh, um, we have about 19 assets and we are present in about 14 countries. Uh, this is for us a very strategic investment. We like platform, I mentioned this yesterday, so we invest in platform, we invest in company. The idea is that we are trying to create a footprint across Africa and that is where the value lies for us. Again, these are long-term uh, vision, long-term investments. Uh, I'm, in, I'm very interested in commenting some of the, the markets you look at. What is interesting also is that we are not just operator, we are owner and operator and developer. Therefore, we own our real estate, and so I have the, if you like, the, the dual vision <laughs> from that respect. So, uh, very interesting, we're expanding fast. Uh, we are planning to, by 2022, to have about 4,500 rooms and to reach about 32 assets, so uh, very exciting times, despite the up and downs. I think the one key point that we have is that there's a strong balance sheet to withheld the, 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 the changes in, 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 in different markets. Great, thanks very much. Um, Ken, if you could. Uh, Ken was saying for, uh, with the IFC, International Finance Corporation, we are a global emerging markets uh, investor. Uh, we invest across uh, all real sectors. Specifically, I lead the Southern African uh, team for manufacturing and consumer services, which for us includes hotels. Uh, in the hotel sector, we, although we look at equity, debt, and instruments in between, the majority of our investments have been uh, debt investments. Um, so we invest pretty much uh, across the continent. Um, in terms of our priorities, it's really looking at uh, markets where uh, there's a supply-demand gap. Um, we're also very keen to support uh, both local sponsors as well as regional and uh, international hotel groups that are expanding their footprint. Okay. David? Uh, good morning, all. I'm uh David Damiba, Managing Partner and Chief Investment Officer of Cassetta Capital Management. We recently launched an um, investment platform focusing solely on hospitality across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. We uh, reached our first close of our, of our fund in April with a half a billion dollars of equity. So we have about a, a billion dollars of, of buying power over the next few years of our investment period. We're set up like a private equity firm uh, with uh, about 10, 12 years in, in, terms, of, in terms of life cycle. Um, we are uh, aiming to be a game changer in the sector uh, by bring, bringing on a multidisciplinary approach to, to the sector and effectively trying to optimize a sector that's been quite fragmented and institutionalize it as well. So we uh, will be investing across the different, um, not only segments focusing on economy and mid-scale, but most importantly we'll do acquisition of existing hotels, but we'll also build uh, from scratch, acquire land and build from scratch hotels across Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, the presentation that Wayne just did is exactly our world and how we think in terms of where should we be allocating our capital and what strategy we should be using. Great, thanks. Uh, ben? Thanks Wayne. Uh, Bevan Smith, Head of Corporate Advisory at GRIT. I also look after the hospitality strategy. Uh, GRIT is um, invested in seven countries. We add $100 million. Uh, 
of which approximately 20% is invested into the hospitality space. Um, I think where we are a little different is we focus on long-term leases, triple net. Uh, we don't currently take any direct operating risk. Um, and we look to uh, partner with our operators in terms of rolling out a broader African strategy, um, currently focusing on the Indian Ocean as well as uh, North and West Africa. Okay, great. Okay, um, in terms of the presentation, I mean, what are your views on the different markets presented and, and investment strategies? And what do you actually, what do you typically consider when preparing your investment strategy? And how much importance do you give to sort of a longer term view, which would be more, the, as I presented, the economic criteria uh, versus more of a shorter term criteria? So. We focus more on the economic and political. How important is that in your strategy? Happy to, happy to go first. Uh, uh, so from the IFC perspective, I think uh, we would use your framework as more as a, as a foundation uh, with, with some very important considerations. Uh, and I'll give some specific examples. The slides that you presented, for example, around sizzling markets. So a few years ago, um, we would see markets like Takaradi in Ghana, where after Ghana, for those an oil find, these markets were sizzling. But then if one doesn't take a very long-term view of capacity that's coming on board, as well as the, the risks of sort of volatility in in-country GDP growth, then you run into trouble. So when we looked at projects like that, at the time, they might have looked brilliant. Within two years, there was a global uh, oil price slump, and then immediately those same projects suddenly became unsustainable. So I think the way we would look at it is looking at sort of the market supply gap and de demand supply gap. We would also look at uh, trends over a much longer period. We also consider the fact that installed capacity in pro projects like hotels are very similar to manufacturing. Once the capacity gets installed and others add capacity, you run the risk of overcapacity. So we look at projects that are all coming on stream. So when we consider one project, we will look at a number of other projects that are being considered for the same market. So you don't end up with saturation and therefore the inability for the for the project to either service the debt or for the equity returns to come down. So, so it's, it's a bit of a taking what you suggested, but looking way beyond that. Yeah, I'll, um, I think from a understanding of the macro is by the nature of investing on a general basis across frontier markets is extremely important because the, we have naturally a higher volatility around the macro, the micro dynamics of the frontier markets, especially in Africa. So, by the very nature of that, from a fundamental, almost academic standpoint, that means that the impact of the micro and bottoms-up analysis that you'll do in investment and the analysis that you'll do will be a lot more affected by the volatility of the macro. So you need to be aware of it. As much as we can do a lot of work on the, on the bottom side, we need to understand what's going on in the macro, where it's coming from, and, and, and what, what, what the, the impact could be. So in the understanding is the GDP growth, is it, for example, you take Nigeria as an example, you need to have a view, and that view needs to be very, very clear, and then as an investor, a long-term investor, understanding what risk you're taking as well. So we pay close attention to that, and especially uh, it's a sector that is highly correlated to, to GDP growth and, 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 and tourism and people coming in, in and out of the country. So it is extremely important, uh, not only in overall in frontier markets, but even more, uh, especially in our sector. combination of course of macro and local but overall I would say that we take a long-term view strategic view there are markets where you need to be present if you really want to achieve this pan-african footprint platform which we believe creates and adds a lot of volume uh, sorry value not volume um, and therefore there are markets which at the moment are not performing but in, in, in a very exciting way an example of course is uh, uh, dar in Tanzania, there is Salam, but the strategic market in, in, in East Africa is one of the, the population is big. I mean, the business over, over time would probably would, uh, believe improve, and therefore you take a view of the market, you establish a presence, you do the proper underwriting, it means that you're not expecting that you're gonna achieve numbers that are absolutely uh, not there, 
but then you see in the context of what you want to build. And obviously we keep an eye on, the, on, on especially for the underwriting, especially for what to expect and the contribution to your revenues, a big die, et cetera, et cetera. But it's more a question of strategic presence for us. Uh, so I think from Grit's perspective, obviously market dynamics will always be important. Um, what we look to do is we look to mitigate these risks that we're discussing um, through uh, our lease structures and passing on a lot of that to the operator that those rental streams are then backed by entire groups, not necessarily just a single asset within one market. Um, I think, however, from our perspective, the political stability of these jurisdictions are massively key as well as the fiscal policies that drive them. You know, we uh, have an investor base out of three stock exchanges. Our ability to repatriate funds, flow money up out of our investment jurisdictions becomes a massively important exercise for us. Uh, so we look very closely at, of course, the macros, but as well as our ability to repatriate, exchange control, debt capital markets. Um, so yeah, fundamentals will always be important. Great. <clears throat> I think I mean, we also look at the short term, if you look at the hotel market life cycle, um, it's generally known in the hospitality sector that, that hospitality goes through like a seven year cycle. And typically that's from sort of a peak to a trough where, where the supply and demand dynamics might cause that to happen. And so from peak to peak, you're looking at often seven years. So, I mean, it'd be interesting to unpack, we've discussed the longer term strategic uh, growth factors, and if we're looking now at the short term, you know, if, if a market has long-term potential but it's under short-term strain and it's in a different part of the life cycle, how do we adapt, how do you adapt your strategies to that? And some of the stuff that I was putting up there is maybe your strategy is slightly different. Instead of obviously doing a greenfield development, you might be looking at an acquisition of existing brownfields or looking at assets that might not have been financially structured correctly or have uh, struggling in terms of getting off the ground. As we see, one of, the, one of the biggest risks in Africa I see from a hospitality or have seen over the years is, is obviously construction and development risk. So, yeah, I'd be interested to get your takes on, on that and how your strategies differ depending on where that market is in that particular life cycle. So, I mean, for the, the IFC is, uh, uh, for equity investments, we are always a minority investor. So we only do a maximum of 20% of the equity value of a company. As a result of that, for equity investments, and I mean, when we do equity investments, our, I mean, we're evergreen, but our average holding period is about seven to eight years. So if we were to look at an equity investment, we would look at it from a longer term perspective, but at the same time, we would look at, as a minority investor, there are not very many things that we can do to drive the investment. So we look at it as, not as a passive investor, but you know, how will the, our other investors be able to successfully drive and manage through these ups and downs of the cycle? On the debt side, it's a, it's a different, uh, slightly different perspective, which is we need to see that the project will have sufficient cash flows even in downturns, to be able to service the debt. So at the beginning of the investment, you know, we will certainly stress test the average daily room rates, the rev pars, and cash flows that will come out even in challenging economic circumstances. Because uh, we don't want to find ourselves having to restructure the debt just because, you know, global oil prices changed, or like in Zambia where you have commodity price fluctuations. So, so depending on what, what instrument we're looking at, we would probably adapt it differently. Now, as a result of that, uh, and also we feel that you know, hotel investments are really sort of two in one. You have property underlying, which is a very long investment, and then a cash flow from the management operations. So if you're in for the property, you can be in there forever, uh, like the case of Casada, and you know, realize capital appreciation from that. Whereas if you're in there as a lender, just, uh, or just in for the management agreement, your investment horizon is a little different. And so we have to adjust for that as well in the structure. David? <clears throat> yeah, in terms, of, uh, in terms of cycles, I think it's a, I would say it could be the most important thing to understand where you are in the cycle. Um, so if presenting an investment opportunity and not understanding where you are in the cycle is potentially a very dangerous thing. At the operational level, where we are in the cycle will inform us in terms of our forward-looking numbers and how we think we can uh, 
you know, optimize or price certain things. So it's quite quite important. And then from a from a from a portfolio management perspective, in terms of investing and and, and deploying your your strategy, it's extremely important. Actually, when you did a pretty good job in in, in showing the different markets, whether they're effectively. Uh, in the bull market or a bear market, and how the strategies can differ from that. As an example, you know, DAR is a market that's been under pressure for various reasons. A lot of them are macro. Um, I happen to actually defer with uh, to, with your view that uh, in that, in a market like that, that's massively under pressure. In our view, most likely going for a greenfield investment probably not the the, the the most efficient way to deploy your capital down there, considering that. Because of the pressure, owners are massively under pressure, debt is underwater, and it might be a good opportunity for people like us to come in and acquire an asset at what would effectively be a discount to construction costs. So depending on all these markets, the cycle will basically lets us take the different tools to deploy our capital. And from a fund perspective, it enables us to also build diversification. So as you saw, Africa is quite wide, and all these markets are in different parts of the cycle. So as you deploy your capital in different parts of the cycle in different countries, you're inherently actually creating a little bit of di even more diversification, which is cyclical diversification, which in the end should be, should, should be, should be better. And also, finally, on the, on, the, on the pure, what is a cycle effectively? So if you're on the right side of the cycle and you invest at the bottom, up, at the bottom of the cycle, you'll benefit from one key thing, which is the market just improving. So you don't have to be unbelievably smart to make money in an improving market because your assets will do better, you know, ADR rates will be, will be going up if you don't have too much supply. But from an investment firm perspective, we feel that we can add that alpha on top of that. So if you add the alpha, which is deploying your capital, understanding the operational improvement, you know, squeezing in the construction costs and getting really a, doing a great job, if you do that and you're and you're going against the cycle, which is effectively the beta of the market's gonna go against you. If you're going against the cycle, you're not necessarily gonna see gains. So you need to understand where you are and, and deploy the capital accordingly, which is why we are, we're, as institutional investors, we, we, we can kind of do that. Um, I think that the cycle, understanding the cycle is fundamental, um, especially for your underwriting, especially if you leverage your assets. Because in my previous life, I've been kept hostage by banks because obviously in bridge of LTV, servicing interest and whatever. So you really have to be solid in the way you underwrite your assets when you decide to invest. In terms of strategy, I think that flexibility remains very important. As in, depending on the market, you can go for an acquisition, if there are acquisition, if there is distress, or if you want to put greenfield. I mean, I think that in these markets, you have to maintain some opportunistic flexibility. So I cannot say just I'm going to do uh, distress or acquisition or greenfield. I mean, we, I think that with Onomo, we've been able so far to actually maintain this flexibility, which is very important. And the last point is that on this, on this panel, we are all balance sheet investors. So we have this, I, I believe that there's no such thing as five years investment cycle, because clearly it's been amply demonstrated it doesn't work. So either you have the capacity, the financial capacity and ability to stay there for <laughs> and, and, and get through a cycle even two, or probably it's the wrong place for you to invest. So I think this is very important. So the structure and the solidity of the, of the capital is very important. <coughs> Obviously, Bevan, yours is slightly different because you, you manage your risk. I mean, your market risk is really managed by the strength of your lease. Correct. Well, and so, I mean, you'll hear, you'll hear Bronwyn um, talk about it. Uh, Adam in his opening address spoke about it as well. Um, counterparty, counterparty, counterparty is always key for us. Um, you know, we, uh, we structure our leases in a, in a very, um, let's say, vanilla triple net lease whereby GRIT uh, essentially keeps all the operating um, risk with uh, our counterparty and our partners. However, what that means is that, you know, there's no um, high, super high returns for us in terms of when a hotel project shoots the lights out and repays itself in three years' time. Uh, so our ability to, to really add value to our shareholders comes more from the structuring perspective in terms of, you know, how we, how we raise the capital against that asset. Uh, the one nice thing is that, um, you know, a property that has a 15-year euro uh, 
bankable lease stream is significantly easier to fund um, than an asset that has a management contract, could even be in you know, the greatest location, but you still have those, um, those cycles, et cetera, that we're speaking about now that you have to be aware of. Um, so you know, that's where we add value. I think just to go back to uh, the previous topic with regards to the cycles, I think from Grit's perspective, uh, you know, we have a total return target of 12%, 8.5% of that is driven by distribution with NAV upside. Um, the one element that we look at quite closely is, is the pricing of the entry point that we acquire these assets um, with the idea that as the market picks up, there'll be some cap rate compression and we will get that NAV growth that we're looking for through these assets. But on a distribution side, you know, these these hospitality deals for us are a cornerstone of our portfolio. They're massively cash generating for us, um, and it's very easy to, to collect a check, um, you know, once a month or three months in advance. Okay, great. I think <coughs> I'd like to look at a bit of a part of a topic that we that I covered in my presentation. I mean, not always people don't always like to talk about it, but. I think we're getting, we're heading us to a situation in, in some markets, to be honest, and, and some have already started experiencing this under increased pressure, especially due to new supply, and maybe current performance, that we're heading towards a sort of semi-distressed or distressed or looking at assets that there might be more distressed assets coming into the market. So I think it's, it's good to understand, and I know we've got, um, we're good to look at some examples that we can, we you don't have to m mention specifics, but if we've got sort of case studies of, of, of different situations and how they're handled. And we can also look at, um, don't necessarily look at, need to look at your, your current um, job profile. But I know David's got a, an equity uh, and a debt also um, background, so does Ilaria. So I think it'd be interesting here also to try and give some insights to existing owners and looking at, you know, what, 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 what are the options open to hoteliers in terms of where they're, where they're coming under increased financial pressure from a debt perspective, from a restructuring? Or, um, you know, can you look at things like asset management or turnaround strategies? What, you know, what, uh, maybe if you've got some case studies or examples, I think uh, this would be something that uh, existing hotel owners can actually learn from. So, um I mean, certainly from the IFC standpoint, I mean, we have a, a plethora of ownership models. Um, we have um, hotels that are standalone projects built by individual sponsors in a single country. Um, we have some other sort of uh, corporate type owners. Um, and then you have this, this trend of, uh, I think one I mentioned specifically is the last, say in Nigeria, markets like Nigeria and Ghana when the oil prices were depressed. Um, owners found themselves really unable to service the debts because the loans are in U.S. dollars, the repayments were in U.S. dollars, but payments are local, and even if, even if they tried to discount in dollar terms, there, was, there wasn't enough cash flows. So in situations like that, that leaves us with a few options. One would be a restructuring of the loan for a period of time, just to try and get the cash flows to match the, the terms of the loan. Um, so whether it's an extension of the tenor or a restructuring of, uh, you know, kind of an interest period. I think increasingly another option would be uh, the opportunities that are available in terms of the likes of a Casada to, you know, bring in institutional owners to perhaps buy up. And then similarly with the likes of a CDC. Uh, we have a few instances that I think are emerging that would lend themselves more to getting uh, someone in like the grits to to take up the management agreement and the cash flow so so it really depends on i mean so those are some examples but i think one very specific uh would be what happened in ghana uh, nigeria um during the global economic uh, oil price downturn about three years ago and we've had to deal with those issues yeah i, th I think your strategies might differ also depending on what is the cause of that strain, you know, is it, is it if it's a, a short-term economic downturn, then you might be looking more at a kind of, um, it, it, I mean, the, the performance of the market could it might not be the assets from that perspective. It's a more of a macroeconomic view. So there, you might, as you say, you might look at just trying to weather that. So you structure the debt so 
you can weather that over sort of five to seven years. But there might be some, you know, fundamentals, you know, it might have been overcapitalized in markets where the hotels might have been overcapitalized or construction costs uh, exceeded, you know, kind of a return and then you're putting pressure on that market, a debt restructuring, unless it's a, you know, in terms of a reduction of the debt is going to be difficult. So you, there might be other strategies you might look at in those markets. Yeah, I think from a, from a pure investment standpoint, I think for the last 10, 12 years, I've, the amount of hospitality deals that I've seen across from, from, from the continent has been, I would say 80% has been because of a debt issue. Um, and that is mainly due to the fact that sometimes debt is offered that should not be taken in some ways by the owners, which is if there's a mismatch in currency, like you mentioned, or the, the tenor is completely wrong. It's three years when it should really be seven to 10. Um, so I think the, you know, in my, in my previous life, I've offered solutions around that, and some of those solutions have been around more of a hybrid solution where you kind of retire the debt with a mezzanine instrument and benefit from the equity. And from a Casada perspective, we'll continue to do that. We have a, a, a large number of opportunities we're looking at now where there's a situation, the underlying asset itself is doing okay, um, but uh, the pressure from the debt and a little bit on the macro is creating an issue. So the solution there usually requires some sort of a, as opposed to just a pure restructuring, which is more like kicking the can down the road uh, of restructuring of the debt. It's, it's really, they, these assets need equity. So uh, when CDC comes in with a large balance sheet and can put money into an operator, that, that stabilizes the, 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 those assets for a very long time and probably they will never have issues uh, unless something uh, enormous happens. So, uh, and from our standpoint as well, it's going in and, and, and being solution providers. So rather than um, us owning all the time 100% of the equity, we might own uh, a, a majority, but maybe 51% or provide an instrument that enables that asset to do better. So the institutionalization of this sector and the fact that new players are coming in, hopefully it's gonna help that. And ideally the banks will, will follow uh, us as well and have a, a, a better understanding of providing the right solution for, 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 these as for this asset class because it's, it's been the single biggest ailment for this asset class the past uh, many years. Yeah, I think I can also add, I mean, we've been involved in this year alone, probably three si similar kind of situations or this year and last year. Um, I mean, one particular situation where actually the bank called us in to look at, you know, A, you've got to understand whether it's, what is the cause from that perspective. Is it a market perspective? Is it an operator perspective or performance of the individual asset? Is it the macro perspective? And then looking at that from a due diligence perspective, we then put in different possible debt strategies. And in this particular one, it was more just to, um, the tenure was, was too short. Um, it was probably over, you know, in terms of the loan to value ratio was a bit too high. And I think, um, you know, if you just massage that debt by looking at maybe a possible balloon payment at the end or extending the period to seven to 10 years, that's, that solved that solution. But then we worked on another one where we looked at all the different options and um, the market was just so down that, and, and it wasn't look, looking at improving in the, in the long term where you had to look at more, more of a kind of aggressive structure. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's good. To, I think the banks are typically, the banks that we've been working with are quite open to trying to, they don't want to foreclose on, on assets and they, they prefer to look at different solutions and, and trying to kind of look at what the, what, what the issues are, underlying issues to look at strategies. Well, in my experience, banks are very reluctant in foreclosing in difficult geographies. And therefore, uh, for as long as there is a belief that there's a strong sponsor, or at least is not is th that there's an issue that can be risk re 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 restructuring, re planned, probably is, is, is the way forward. I was caught after the financial crisis in 2008, over leveraged and without much more equity to invest. So I won't be in that situation ever again. So leverage for me is the, <laughs> is the enemy, is the scare. <laughs> Okay, I don't know if anybody wants to add anything. Um, there's nothing further to add. I think we can open some questions um, from the audience. Does anybody have any questions for our panelists? Please raise your hand if you do and we can get a mic to you. 
Uh, we got, we've got a hand, uh, gentleman over there. Um, is this working? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we own property that's zoned for hotel coastal space um, in the Western Cape, and we just about to start building, um, which, which will be for us our first hotel. So it's echoing a bit, so I'm just hearing myself three times. Um, my question to you is, how would you guys go about, if you are the property owner, to make sure that the management company that goes with you into this property, which you own, have some skin in the, in the game? Because for all practical reasons, they can just pull up their shoulders after two years and say, hmm we're just not working so hard at this or it's not working and I just thought that would be a good question maybe to ask to you guys. Um, 15 year lease. <laughs> <laughs> We've tried but they're not biting. <laughs> I think, um, I mean from our perspective, obviously we, we do a lot of feasibility studies um, on new developments and looking at opportunities. I think you need to look at, you look at the potential of that particular um, assets. Um, if it's in a leisure destination, obviously it's more risky. The operators would be less likely to take any concessions in terms of, I mean, they're not necessarily going to put in equity, but they could look at structuring management agreements where some risk is pushed back onto into operators if it's a management agreement. Um, but I think you need to understand the risks yourself. And so the m first thing is to look at a proper feasibility to understand the potential volatility in that market and then you can try and spread that risk. If, if, it's, a, if it's a really good project, um, you'll have obviously a lot more flexibility in, in your negotiation and you'll have more, more power in that negotiation. I, I would add in addition to the two comments uh, to structure a management fee agreement that includes a component of, um, of separating the profit share. So you could have a percentage of turnover, a percentage of profits, uh, that are more back-ended so that, so that the, you, you're not giving away all the upfront fees in the early years, uh, especially during the challenging periods. That may be one way to think about it. I think they very much depend on markets and what's the appetite of the, of the, of the operators to get into the market. Um, they have different strengths. Uh, normally, they're very reluctant to invest even a penny, especially in this continent, I'm afraid. So it's not an easy one. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm on your side. <laughs> I've always been an, an, an owner with a lot of difficulties with the operator, so <laughs> we share it. Do you have any other questions? Anybody else? Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Owen. I'm with an advisory company called Arigo. Uh, my question is to the panel, uh, and I suppose all of you. Uh, with relation to high-risk uh, destinations, um, whether those risks are political, socio-economic, uh, financial, uh, or tenureship, um, but if that, that part, particular market has a um, uh, successful you know, history of, of revenue and high tenancy, what is the risk appetite for both investors and, uh, and operators and the reason I'm asking this is um, we've got some opportunities in the Victoria Falls area. And inevitably, uh, the, the Victoria Falls is like a little economy within a country that is going through a lot of turmoil. Now, the question is, um, the country has a very high, potentially one of the highest political, social, economic, and financial, uh, including tenure issues. But the operators who've uh, operated, they've successfully done so for the last three decades through the troughs and the highs. Um, so my question is, what kind of investment appetite would both the investors and the operators have in a market such as um, Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe side? From a, from a, from a Quesada standpoint, we are in some of these markets will be opportunistic, so I think that falls into the opportunistic bucket. So if, from an investment perspective, you have an investment that has a 
effectively an inherent defensive nature to it because it's, it is in this microcosm of indeed a, a, a more risky environment and it's done well for, for, for many years. It's something we can, we, we can look at, but again, it's more opportunistic. And uh, some of the other risks that are surrounding it from a macro perspective can actually in certain ways be, uh, be either insured or de-risk a little bit. So it's something we, 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 we can contemplate. It is not the core of our strategy, but it's part of a bucket of, of opportunistic uh, investments. I think I can add to that. I mean, we've done actually quite a lot of work in Victoria Falls over the last year, and we've seen a revived interest in Vic Falls. Um, I think it's because, as you mentioned, it's almost like a sort of economy in itself because it's, it's on the outskirts, it's on the, on the border of the country, it's, it's linked more towards, obviously, across the border in Zambia with the attraction of Vic Falls. And Vic Falls is, is an add-on tourism destination to, to other markets. And especially in the upscale and the luxury scale, we've seen a, a, a great increase in that because increased tourism, increased flight access has also facilitated better regional traffic uh, um, with bush, bush destinations. So I think um, in that, that's a classic example, I think, although there's a, there's, there's a very strong underlying negative um, macroeconomic environment, political, but it, Victoria Falls also is quite a, a forex cash generator, and so it, it, it sort of it sort of weathered that, and the attraction is more that it's it's potential, but it is a leisure destination which can be volatile. So just to echo, um, sister organization for the IFC is uh, multilateral investment guarantee agency MIGA, and e MIGA coverage is, is available in a number of uh, challenging markets from a political risk insurance perspective. So there, there are some countries uh, that one may perceive as challenging from a political environment. And even mega coverage is also available for things like transfer and inconvertibility risk. So a good example now is Angola. You know, I think uh, um, mega is now open for business. So you can buy insurance coverage that would actually protect certain aspects of uh, um, the risks. Okay, I think that I think we're out of time, and uh, I'd just like to thank my panel. And I, I'm sure they'll be open to any one-on-ones. If you if you feel you still want to ask them a few more questions, please feel free to reach out to them. And thank you very much for your valuable insights and your time. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the panelists for giving us their views as well as their feedback and insight. And lots of opportunities clearly that can be explored across the continent, even in markets that are still experiencing some significant challenges at the moment. But of course, they are available for further conversation. <laughs>